Over the past few years, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has been working on a new report covering everything you need to know about climate change. It's both depressing and inspiring. On the one hand, it shows how people are already dying from climate change and the effects are likely to only get worse. On the other hand, it shows us that we have solutions. In fact, scientists have already solved climate change at least on paper. Even before this report came out, experts from an organization called Drawdown devised over 100 solutions to the climate crisis. If we do all of them, we'll be pulling down CO2 every year instead of emitting more. So if we have all the solutions, why do we still have to worry about climate change? Basically, because no one is stepping up to pay for it. At a high level, to end the climate crisis, we need to do five things. We need to stop burning fossil fuels, switch over all our old fossil fuel infrastructure to electric infrastructure, transform our food systems, protect and restore our ecosystems, and clean up heavy industry. If we can do those five quickly enough, we're good. Climate crisis over. So what's stopping us? There are two types of climate solutions. The ones that will make investors rich, and the ones that won't. Let's take, for instance, renewable energy. The renewable sector has made tremendous progress over the past 20 years. While the biggest source of renewable energy today is hydropower from dams, wind and solar are the fastest growing renewables. In 2021, the cost of building new wind and solar energy was actually cheaper than building new fossil fuel energy. New solar modules saw their price fall to less than half of what they cost in 2013, and they're only going to become more affordable from here. Since people pay for their electricity and renewables are more cost effective than fossil fuels, we're in a way winning the battle on electricity. We could win it faster and it'd be easier if governments pushed more subsidies for renewables, but at this point renewable energy has become a good deal for investors and it's almost inevitable that we'll see more and more of it. Electric vehicles are the same story. Over the past 20 years, partly thanks to government subsidies, we've seen the sector blow up as both upstarts like Tesla and existing players like Nissan invest billions into making electric vehicles. For these companies, there's a strong strong economic case to put money into electric vehicles. They see that EVs are the future and they want to lead the pack and become the brand that people think of when they think of EVs. Because of the growing interest around EVs, investors are willing to put more and more funding into the sector and they expect to eventually see strong returns as more electric vehicles are sold. Other solutions like building retrofitting and insulation could be profitable too. Insulation reduces the need for heating and cooling, which over the long term creates cost savings for the building owner. LED lighting uses less electricity while often providing better lighting and needing to be changed less often. Electric bikes can also be a more convenient and affordable transport method in cities while reducing emissions. It helps for governments to push companies and it helps for individuals to demand more sustainable products, but fundamentally these solutions can actually be profitable on their own. But unfortunately, not all climate solutions are appealing to profit-seeking investors. Plant-rich diets are an important climate solution that capitalism is yet to crack. Although some upstart like Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods generated a lot of hype, they have had a rocky ride from an investment perspective and we aren't seeing as much adoption of plant-based foods as we need to. Spreading plant-based diets may be an idea that only catches on thanks to the goodwill of people like you and I rather than through capitalism. Although I wish everyone making new delicious plant-based foods would become rich and famous, we might have to switch our diets just because it's good for the planet and animals and as a result, good for us. And it is really, really good for the planet. Experts estimate switching to plant-rich diets could prevent 80 billion tons of CO2 by 2050. That's like preventing two full years of emissions. That's even more impact than switching to electric vehicles is estimated to have. And that's not even assuming everyone would go fully vegan. That's just what would happen if we cut back on meat. If it sounds too good to be true, that's because it probably is. It will be nearly impossible to get everyone on earth to change their diets. But but we can still make considerable progress by trying and see a significant reduction in emissions. However, not every solution can be implemented through a grassroots behavior change like this. Over the past 70 years, we've lost nearly half our remaining rainforest. Since each hectare of rainforest can store 300 tons of CO2, the alarming rate of deforestation is one of the biggest sources of CO2 emissions today. Rainforest protection is a tricky problem. It's obviously not profitable from an investment standpoint to just leave the forest stand in fact, there's like financial pressure to cut the trees down and make more land for cattle grazing or agriculture. Since it just takes a few people to illegally log large portions of a forest, it's not enough to just make some laws that prohibit deforestation. Any law that's made needs to be enforced, and that will only happen if there's the support of both local governments and local people. It's another case where prioritizing the planet is directly opposed
leads to short-term profits, and we will have to chart a path to global cooperation in order to save the forests we have left. Luckily, we do have some historical precedent for coming together to save the planet. The world has been gradually phasing out highly polluting refrigerant chemicals for the past 35 years, thanks to a global agreement known as the Montreal Protocol. These refrigerants are used in everything from the fridge and air conditioner in your own home to industrial refrigerators and warehouses and supermarkets. Each individual molecule of these refrigerants heats Earth 2,000 times faster than a molecule of CO2 does. It may not be a super well-known problem, but each year these pollutants cause more warming than air travel does. How do we make it happen? How do we get all these solutions implemented? Although unregulated capitalism is arguably the root cause of climate change, it weirdly enough is going to lead to some of these solutions actually being built. New solar and wind projects are on average more cost effective than fossil fuel projects, and electric vehicles have started catching on partly just because they're cool and people want to buy them. Of course, government incentives can and should be used to help these solutions scale up faster, but we've already hit a sort of tipping point on some of these, where the free market is pulling these solutions into existence. But there is this whole class of climate solutions where there is no way for someone to profit. What's the return on investment for a tree left standing of replanting a mangrove, eating more plants and fewer animal products? Tragically, in the society we live in, if something doesn't generate profit, it's unlikely to happen. Luckily, it's possible to change society. We can vote and influence our politics to elect leaders who create subsidies and incentives that can match the profit-seeking business mindset with the far more important human mindset that we all embody. We can also be the change we want to see in the world and inspire others to follow our lead and take action themselves. If you're looking for a way you can help, the company I founded called REN offers easy ways to get started. Check out the link in the description to get your own personalized on-ramp into climate action by telling us about your lifestyle and seeing what you personally can do to move things in the right direction.